very good morning, world. Good morning, Africa. We bring you special greetings from Nairobi, Kenya. Welcome to the African Investigative Journalism Conference 2021. And we're coming to you live from the beautiful city of Nairobi. My name is Solomon Serwanja, and I am the executive director of the African Institute for Investigative Journalism. And I'm super excited to be hosting our first panel today where we're going to discuss how domestic and foreign intelligence agencies and propaganda machineries engage in mis- and disinformation to subvert public policies and fuel social conflict. First of all, let me start by saying a special thank you to all our audience from all across Africa and from here in Nairobi. Thank you so much for being part of the conference. So let me just introduce my panelists this morning. I want to start with Kevin Rubio, Vice President and Director Independent Media um, at the DT Institute in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for flying from the U.S. up to here. Thank you so much for being part of the panel this morning. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's such an honor to have you. Let me also uh, introduce Paris Gachahi. He's a reporter, producer, and fact checker at Africa Uncensored. Thank you so much for being part of the panel, Paris. Thank you for coming through for us today. Thanks for having me. Great. I also want to introduce Alan Cheboy, who is a senior investigations manager at Code for Africa. Alan has done amazing work, and we'll be sharing shortly about what he has so far done. Uh, Alan, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Pleasure being here. All right. So that said, I want to give you a preamble to this session. And disinformation, misinformation, and the fake news uh, ideology that was coined by the then president, Donald Recording Trump. Recording in progress. I think he actually um, coined this tool more, uh, the fake news uh, ideology, Donald Trump. But what we have seen over the last couple of years and what history has taught us is how people are now taking advantage of the social spaces to spread disinformation and misinformation. And it always comes through at different levels. And it has brought in both local, regional, and international players to push a certain agenda. And there's no person better than people who have taken advantage of this opportunity than the politicians themselves. And speaking of politicians, I come from Uganda, um, where we just concluded our elections in February 2021. And what we saw during that time is how the social spaces were used as, you know, it was a theater uh, for political showdowns between the opposition uh, and, 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 and government and the different political players using different strategies to win people to their side. I just wanted to give you a short story of what happened in, in, in Uganda and we saw the both the opposition and government coming and teaming up with people who were known as the social media giants. For example, government has an institution, the GICC, which, according to reports, they got different, you know, um, people put them in different rooms, and they were putting out content in a coordinated behavior. And part of it was to spread propaganda, and along the way we saw a lot of lies spoken against the opposition. I can give you a classic example of how, for example, uh, the then um, main opposition candidate in Uganda's election, Robert Chagulani, who is famously known as Bobby Wine, was portrayed to be so homophobic. You know, pictures went out that he was supporting, you know, homosexuality. We saw, um, you know, pictures, uh, you know, showing Bobby Wine in the U.S. and saying that he was, you know, reaching out to homosexuals to fund his election. And this is, was in a way to portray him negatively before the audience, right? We saw, um, again, government accounts sh portraying him also as violent. And, and when we saw the same thing happening in the opposition, where opposition people, too, also came up with bolts. Um, they, they, they were driving a certain agenda in a certain way. So certainly we saw that manifest through the Ugandan elections. And uh, this morning as I read a report which was also giving other examples where misinformation was used all across Africa in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Sudan, 
uh, as well as in Eritrea in the Tigri war. And today we want to really compound this conversation and help our audience understand what mis and disinformation is all about, but also how does it manifest and what are the dangers if nothing is done. And I perhaps would love to start off with Alan. Um, as I told you, Alan, um, at the peak of the Ugandan elections, what we saw was Facebook got involved. Um, the media entities got involved. Facebook investigated inauthentic behavior. They investigated the bolts. They went back end, and they, they closed over 30 pages. Some of them were belonging to um, you know, prominent people in the Ugandan government. And the result of that was that Facebook was closed from Uganda. And up to now, I think there's uh, still ongoing conversations to have that straightened. So talk to us about, and I know that you're one of the people who are, st who are studying uh, the phenomenon in Uganda. What did you find? Yeah, so I think let me break it down and start from the top. Because I know there are people in the audience who probably understand mis and disinformation, but don't know the kind of phenomena that that is, right? Yeah. So uh, just to introduce the topic itself where we are saying what is misinformation and what is disinformation, yeah? So that you can set the context on what was being observed in Uganda and also internationally as Kevin will probably highlight uh, in a few minutes. So just to the audience, uh, out here many people refer to this as fake news. But when, when we are doing research, we do categorize fake news into two different situations, which is misinformation and disinformation. Where misinformation basically means where uh, I, as Alan, or someone uh, who's probably in my communication channels, will share some bit of false information without having the intention to harm myself. So sharing with me a WhatsApp message or me sharing a COVID-19 information in a WhatsApp group, but I don't have a clear intention to harm uh, the recipient of that information. So that is what we call misinformation. But disinformation, on the other hand, now brings in the harm element. So the clear intention of the person who's sharing that information is to harm the recipient of that particular information. So that is one clear thing that you need to always have in mind because misinformation is usually content driven. So where you see a political messaging from a government or from an opposition, but only sharing one piece of content to discredit the other side. So that is just misinformation. So it's not driven by a network of people. It's not an organized situation. But when you now turn to disinformation is where these people have the real intention to actually influence your behavior, influence your decisions, and also to just make you aware of that situation. So that is where we now have disinformation campaigns. And when you are looking at the Uganda election, uh, so I can come back to your question, the situation there was now a disinformation campaign. It was a domestic disinformation campaign. So we also have international, we have foreign, we have a domestic disinformation campaign. And domestic means where a government is targeting its people or a government is targeting uh, the opposition or even the opposition targeting its people or even the government. So that is in a domestic context. context. And that is what was happening in Uganda because when you looked at it is uh, the government of Uganda, one of the situations we actually investigated together with Paris was that there was a network of accounts, a fake accounts, sock puppet accounts that were created to actually amplify some bit of information that was being posted on the internet. And what we actually saw was that it was an election period and the key intention of this account was to actually discredit the, the other side, the opposition. And they started a hashtag called Stop Hooliganism, and what they were posting there is basically, uh, these opposition people are on the streets, they are burning houses, they are beating people, they are committing crime. So at the end of the day, the intention there was to tell the uh, Ugandan people that these people are bad people. They are now committing crime, they are doing violence on the streets, so let's let's actually take action against them. And what, that actually led to the police being sent to the ground. Many people were killed, about 45 people, as per the recent uh, CNN report that I, I read, about 45 people were killed on, killed on that particular situation. So, and it all started from social media. So that's how the power of social media actually is. Yeah. And, and having monitored this, what did you do about it? 
Yes, so uh, with partnerships that we have, uh, both uh, with social media companies, with new news organizations, the first thing is how do you push out the information so that the public knows that this is happening? Because you might, be, uh, you might just see a social media post on WhatsApp calling you to go, to, uh, to, to, do, to go and protest against the other side, yeah? But if there is no prompt information that reaches you, you'll actually decide to go there, and then, of course, you'll end up being part of that conflict that is happening on the ground. So what we did is we worked together with Paris here, who is a, a journalist. She'll speak more about the journalistic element to actually tell the public and to inform the public what is happening. And then also with partnerships with social media companies, you actually point them to that situation. Elections are usually a very prime area where you need to, of course, Facebook is not everywhere. They don't understand the context. They don't understand the nuances of what is happening locally. So like, for example, they don't understand what is happening in Kenya. There could be some people who are creating a network and sharing propaganda, but they don't know that unless you point them to it. So on that day, what we did is we actually sent a couple of assets that we were uh, identified they are sharing false information, sent it to the platform, and they did their own internal investigations, and they published a report saying that we actually could attribute this network of accounts that are sharing this information to this entity within the government. So that, that is specifically the actions that we, ta we took, and I think it's what we should always do, uh, take. At least uh, that meant that we can now influence the decisions and what is happening on the ground by just showcasing what is actually happening. Wow, thanks. Um, the reason why I asked you that is because as a result of those uh, red flags that were coming from all the different parts of, of Africa, um, Facebook decided to close so many accounts and of course that angered the state and uh, Facebook in itself was closed in Uganda on the orders of President Yuri Museveni. Um, let me come to you, Paris. Are you seeing that likely to manifest in the Kenyan elections as it's building up? Um, yes, definitely. And it's something we've already started seeing. But first, I think we need to appreciate that this is not new. The only thing that has changed is the manner in which this kind of propaganda is being driven, especially by politicians and governments. Now that we're in the age of social media, you have influencers. You can create bots to do this work for you. But if we can go back to how it used to happen in the past, where you have politicians physically paying people to go around mudslinging and driving a lot of fake news just to uh, make the opposition look bad. But now we've moved that, so it's only the avenue that has changed. It's pretty much the same thing. But now we have an unlimited space where guys can just come in the age of also citizen journalism. And it's something, uh, it's probably a conversation we need to have at some point because anybody now can take their phone, create information, create a YouTube page, anything, and just start information, spread information. And for people who take everything viral to be the truth, then that is where we start having a problem. And that's why I appreciate the kind of uh, work that organizations that like Code for Africa are doing, the fact-checking organizations we have now, and also really appreciating that we get to collaborate with them. Because in my capacity as a storyteller, there's only so much I can do to put this information out. Go on the ground, talk to a few people, then come and tell you, okay, this happened today. But when you have the expertise like he has and Rubio has, and combine that, you're then able to have a more cohesive and a more a, a richer way of uh, tell, telling these stories. But one of the things that we actually did, uh, along with the Uganda investigation that you were talking about, is another one we focused on Kenya's keyboard warriors. Well, Kenyans on Twitter are very active, and everybody has an opinion on everything. And it is something our politicians have seen and known they can capitalize on to distract people. So where you have, in a country where you're using billions in a day, you decide today, let's talk about the deputy president. So start a hashtag, distract people completely. When we were also thinking about just the Building Bridges Initiative, when that was happening, we also saw a lot of misinformation because you have two different opposing sides telling you, okay, Ruto is bad because of this. The pres then what do we have in turn? A counter narrative to counter what was started. So you end up having a huge network of 
accounts, some of them not real, just the driving this information. Now we are getting into elections next year, we are preparing for this. It is definitely something we've started seeing. There's a new hashtag every day that so and so is not good for you, so and so did this. We even start going back to corruption cases that happened in the past. And then what are we doing at the end of the day? Creating more networks, creating more networks of misinformation. But then I think in my capacity, what would be really important for us, especially the media, then what do we do? How do we package this information to ensure that it's getting to the right people? Yeah, not everybody's online. And even for the people that are online, uh, then everybody takes this information as truth. So who is saying the truth at the end of the day? One of the biggest problems we had Solomon, I think, that has been a running issue with our country every time we're talking about politics is tribalism. Yeah. And which is largely driven by our vernacular radio stations. So we also need to think about how this kind of investigations really get to the grassroots. Those are the people who need to hear this. You and I can understand it when we read it on a dossier that is 52 pages. You know, Alan will do an investigation and then tell me, okay, here is the report. How do we disseminate this to the public? Yeah? yeah. I cannot take that and give to someone who has no idea, no idea what a bot is, has no idea what social media is even, because not everybody has it. So how do we repackage this and ensure it's getting to the right people? At the end of the day, we can sit here and talk, and talk, and you know, get ask the government, the Ministry of IT, what can we do about these policymakers? What can we do to change this? But if we are not packaging this info in a way that is reaching the right people, the most vulnerable in our population, then we are just going around in circles. But it is something that is definitely starting, uh, continuing to happen and going into next year, we need to be on toes. And I agree, I can't agree more with you because ultimately what is discussed in many of the radio shows and the television shows is a reflection of what is online. So except if you come out and first of all counter what is online, then you'd have, you know, a, in a way influenced how the discussions are going on using the different platforms that reach the very last person in the grassroots. I mean, we've had so many political debates based on what has been seen online or what is being talked about online. And if no one comes out to actually counter what is actually being put out, and like I say, I want to say a special thank you to Code for Africa, Africa, checkers, who have come out to really fight this disinformation. And also, I agree with you on the, on the issue that you said that it is important for us to package this information better and get it away from the inauthentic coordinated behavior, CIB, to all these back-end things, to actually break it down into material that people can consume. We'll come back to that later. Ruby, this, I mean, Kenya, Uganda, Africa, but we've also seen such things happening in developed democracies, and people are mastering how to use disinformation and misinformation campaigns. And did you see this manifest in, in, in the US elections? Let's start there. What, what, do you, what, what do we learn? What do we get from that side of the world? Yeah. Oh, certainly we saw it in the U.S. Yeah. elections, and um, both from op actors within the U.S. as well as foreign actors trying to uh, influence the elections uh, in the United States. Um, we saw actors such as Iran and Russia trying to um, push some of the, the some of the social issues that, that are very kind of uh, high on the agenda in people's minds and using those social issues, where it's, whether it's Black Lives Matter or any other issues. And so, yes, that's, that was certainly something central to the US elections as well. Great, if you can just talk to us about how does it work? Take us in, first of all, mm -hmm. in these campaigns mm -hmm. from, from, from you know, from meetings, what usually happens, you know, let's just get under the skin of, of some of these campaigns and how governments mm -hmm. use them to mm -hmm. creation of bolts to coming up with content that they push out to the times and everything. Mm -hmm. Can you just be kind enough to sort of take us there, take the audience there and try to help us understand how this whole misinformation and disinformation, especially online, mm -hmm. works, especially pushed by politicians? Sure. Um, well, let me talk about kind of foreign actors and foreign actors kind of uh, influence outside of their countries because that's really kind of what um, my work is really focused on. Um, and I think, um, let me take it back instead of to the US, back to the, this continent. 
um, and some of the things that I've been seeing in terms of foreign actors. Uh, certainly there's the state actors like Russia and China um, that have kind of macro level and long-term interests um, in the continent. And then there's other actors that sort of ride the coattails of these states, and those, are, those would be um, smaller groups as well as some of the uh, politicians and uh, corporations and businessmen, businessmen that are aligned with governments. And so they're always kind of looking for opportunities to build up their businesses in alignment with their, their foreign state government. Yeah, and you talked about foreign, um, foreign countries. It just takes me to one of the stories that has always been highlighted in different reports, and I think Tessa, who um, I think, yeah, worked on a project with the African Center for Strategic Studies, highlighted Russia's involvement in Sudan. Mm -hmm. Would you consider that as a campaign that was well orchestrated to make Russia look good um, while they were trying to win, you know, international favors of Russia's involvement in South Sudan, in Sudan, sorry? Yeah, uh, even more specific of Russia, I think it's, um, to highlight a certain kind of business and the business concerns in the country and try to make it look good. But the problem was there is that they were, they were really focused on uh, an approach that was kind of um, inauthentic, trying to use sock puppets, trying to use fake accounts uh, to promote their business interests and the, the work that they were doing within Sudan. Okay, great. Um, I'll come back to you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Um, Alan, how dangerous is it to allow misinformation to take root on both social but also in traditional media? Uh, and, and the politicians have learned how to use it, but how dangerous is it? I mean, um, I mean, we all know about the Cambridge Analytica story and its involvement in the Kenyan election. Um, we, we know what happened in Uganda. At, how far can it go? What are the dangers that come with that? So uh, I think when it comes to the dangers of mis- and disinformation specifically, uh, it has a lot of, uh, it, the, the main I issue here is the disinformation campaign is meant to change your mindset. So there's something that you would have done on a normal, if someone had not impacted any kind of influence on you, or any information operations on you, there's a mindset that you have on how you would think, there's a decision you would make without considering all these external factors. But when you see a particular set of information so much, yeah, and that is why amplification is what is important in this conversation, because the more you see that content or the more you see that communication happening, you tend to now believe it and you make decisions that align to that content, right? And that is why we are seeing Paris was talking about uh, social media bots. So the reason these people uh, are using social media bots is actually to put content in front of your eyes every single time. And that what, that's what uh, the alleged uh, Cambridge Analytica scenario was. Because here we were seeing that there is a lot of content that was being created about Kenya, about the opposition in Kenya at that time. And depicting, de depicting the opposition at that time as a very bad uh, choice if you actually select these people during the next election, you will have conflict, the Al-Shabaab or terrorism will now be full-time in, in the country, something like that. So the more you see that, you're now seated thinking, wow, this can really happen. We'll have terrorists all over Kenya. So what then happens? You now get to make probably the wrong decision to go out there and protest against uh, that that opposition uh, a person or the person who the campaign was against, right? And what happened in Uganda is the, that even led to death because once you change the mindset of a person and you, you, you create a mentality that this is really bad, you know, that person will now act out of that context, out of that information and can even go to the streets, can even go to start now committing violence in the street just because of that information and that leads to a lot of uh, uh, harm at the end of the day. Democratically, uh, so there is that physical harm that can happen, but democratically there is also a lot of information. As you seen, Kevin is talking about foreign influence. Uh, we've been highlighting a lot of domestic influence, but any country that is vulnerable, and vulnerability here comes in when there is elections, when there is conflict, there are a lot of aspects that determine that. Other nations, foreign nations, always want to intervene 
and push their own interests. Yeah? And these foreign nations, what they will do is they want to control the conversation in your country through social media and the media. That is why you are seeing very many uh, organizations or media organizations are being bought by organizations that are foreign, right? There is a, a, a media house that probably is partially owned by a foreign organization and they end up pushing a lot of content through that media so that the local people in that, uh, 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 in that uh, country will see that information and make decisions based on that, yeah? Uh, uh, just before Kevin you intervene, uh, there is one, the situation you highlighted in Sudan. So there is a partnership that is about to be done between Sudan and, and Russia. Yeah? So why was this happening? So you will question yourself, there is a decision that has to be made. So why do we have content spreading from Russia with love eh? scenarios in the country? Why? Why? Yeah. You now start to question on that perspective. Yeah? And they are using social media boards, they are using fake accounts, which is now bring, bringing the inauthentic part on it. And that now is, becomes a problem because people will make decisions based on that that probably will not be preferable to their, to their own uh, democracies. Yes, Kevin, you... Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on a point that you were, you were mentioning, Alan, um, in terms of the relationship between foreign state media outlets and local or national media outlets, because I see that happening a lot more in different manifestations. You see the, the above board cooperation between say uh, RT Russia Today and Sputnik and local news channels in terms of the sharing information. Then you see some things, uh, phenomena like franchising as you were talking about, which there's a, uh, some way of co-opting kind of the, the local media outlets so that you can run your um, information operations through them to make it look much more authentic. And so I think it's uh, different tracks that we're going to be seeing in terms of foreign actors and how they work with local media actors as well. Yeah, um, interesting. Um, I, I was following that uh, Sudan story and gifts with Russia uh, with love, you know, from, from love, you know, to, to, to Sudan, um, you know, gifts from Russia, and, and how, you know, um, this was so much in, in, in favor of having the people to support the construction of the military base um, in Sudan, and how from nowhere Russia became increasingly um, in love with Sudan. Just interesting how all that information was put out. And we also saw this in, um, in, 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 in the Congo, but we'll come to that. I'll come to you, Paris. And he's talked about the dangers of what this can bring. We've seen war coming out of just such campaigns. We've seen violence erupting from such campaigns. We all remember where Kenya came, came from, um, in the, the history of Kenya's elections and political turmoil in this country. Um, is, is one that we don't want to go back to, and hopefully that we don't, because um, we don't, if, if we cannot manage the information that is going out, right now Uganda has its eyes in, on Kenya in, in terms of what's going on. We are closely monitoring, you know, we're seeing how Ruto is being painted as the bad guy, um, with content coming out, we're seeing, I mean, we're trying to also follow up, and hopefully we can as well monitor, like how you did monitor the Ugandan elections and produce a report out of it, but what can we do about it as journalists? Paris, what can we do about it? I think one, uh, and it's something that I've seen we've already tried to do, is training journalists, one. Because this is not something that you'd go and learn in your basic journalism course, say in college, in campus. Yeah? These are additional skills that we've acquired along the way. Now, a few years ago, this is not something I would have been able to do. But through this, the kind of collaborations that we've had with organizations that uh, have the expertise to do this kind of investigations, now we are able to do it. I can be able to sit down and be able to tell, hey, there's something wrong with this particular trend. There's something wrong with this particular hashtag. As opposed to just being a field journalist where you go to the field, talk to someone, then come package it and tell people, okay, so this happened today, or waiting for to be called and be told that something happened, let's rush there. Now things have moved online. So how, is, how as big as the media can we be able to find our space in there? 
you know. So having these trainings, training our media channels in the newsrooms, have them trained, let them have these skills. Which tools can we use? This is new, this is new to us, yes, but it's something we have to adapt to. It's something we have to adjust if we are going to diversify the way we tell our stories, the way we tell our news. Also, there's a need for, now, when, once we get these skills as storytellers, what do we do with that to inform the public? Because at the end of the day, it goes back to that. And I will say that a lot because that's the bottom line. We have to package this information and give it to the public in to know that you don't need to jump on every trend that you find online, that the minute you jump on that, oh, Ruto must go, Huru must go, or so and so is a thief hashtag, and we retweet it. And be as to you, you are amplifying a propaganda campaign. You had no idea that this is what is happening, but there's a need to educate the public as well. So I think those two would be the most important things to do Just, going forward. Yeah, yeah. And you hinted a little bit about it. Um, talk to me about the power of collaboration um, between entities in fighting this vice. Because I know that Code for Africa does the, you know, they work around there, but, you know, they can only do their work behind it and, you know, what's the power of collaboration in the future of investigative journalism and putting out investigative stories that counter misinformation and disinformation? Okay. I think I'll take this back to the first time that I had the interaction with Code for Africa and an investigation they, ha they have done, or they had done on fake jobs and scams that were very simple at first, and I was like, it was so fascinating to me. I was like, wow, you can be able to get this much information on Facebook alone. And it was just a few pages. I was like, wait, so how much more then can we be able to do this? So now remember, Alan in his capacity is not a journalist. But he has the expertise to be able to point me to all these things and tell me, hey, there's something fishy going on here. He has the tools, he has the know-how, he has the background in for forensics and, an and, and analytics. Something that I would shy away from because it is not my forte, naturally. I would be shy from, I would shy away from that. But the minute I sat down with him and I was like, okay, wow, this is interesting. So having him in his capacity and me in my capacity as a journalist and having the know-how to package this and tell it in a certain way that is more digestible for the audience has been what has really pushed us. Because it's not something I can do alone. It's not something, he, he can put it together, but he'll give me 50 pages worth of a report. Now, I'm not going to publish that and tell anybody to read it because you would need to have the, either the interest or the know-how to understand how, what it is that he's saying. You're using a lot of jargon, tech words, a lot of big words, but how do we package this differently? So working together with them. It's like when you're doing, um, I liken this to doing a data story. So you're not a statistician, you're not a mathematician, you don't like, you don't like numbers at all. But there's a lot of information in numbers, so what do you do? Lie us with a data journalist, get a statistician. And that's why we are seeing a lot of uh, have, we are working a lot now more even with data journalists. So diversifying this, combining our strengths, there's a lot of power in that. And going forward, it's something we really need to stress on. And even just to mention, maybe going forward, when we have these kinds of info, in, investigations done, and once they are put out to the public, let's have a bit more conversations around them. Let's be more deliberate and intentional in how we put it out. and. Even now we have things like Twitter spaces. Let's have a chat about it. Invite the necessary people. We, have, we are now really working on working with the webinars. So let's do the same thing. We have this report, fine. We have said that there's a lot of in disinformation that was going on when uh, around the Ugandan elections. Let's talk about it, you know? Let's have a bit more engagement across the continent such that if such an investigation has been done, say, in South Africa, like what the DFR lab does, a lot of them, similar things. But do we get to, unless you're interested, you will not get such information come to you just like that. But the minute we are liasing with across the continent, and I appreciate Code for Africa for doing that, liasing with newsrooms across the continent, such that if something is happening in Uganda, something is happening in Kenya, we're even finding similarities. We're able to tell, oh, this is not unique to this particular country. They're using the same methodologies. They're using the same thing across the board. Yes, Kevin. Ruby. So I just want, 
I just wanted to pick up on a point that Paris was making. Um, and I, I think it's kind of important also that media outlets and journalists in the continent also not only reach out to the general public, but also look towards policymakers and trying to get policymakers to have a depth of understanding of the issues of disinformation and information disorder within their country and how it affects them. Um, I'd also like to see media outlets and journalists cover a lot more of the issues around regulation of some of the media platforms and things that are going on, particularly in the US, because I think that'll give them uh, a better understanding of the direction of how they should look at the social media platforms and, and various uh, websites uh, and how they should work with them on a legislative level. And, and again, on that note, Ruby, then returns the conversation of how far can the state go to regulate people's freedoms online. Um, you know, you, and yes, we are all in this war fighting misinformation and disinformation, and you're saying that we could now look at policy frameworks that can be able to sort of support the fight, but then that would also bring up, you know, issues of media freedoms online. And how do you tread that thin line? I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer that. Um, what I can tell you, though, is that, um, why I'm mentioning as, as an important element is that a lot of the platforms that Africans use and work on and get their information from are platforms that are in the US and they're run from the US. And so the importance of how they are first started to be understood as needing to be regulated should provide some insight or maybe some understanding for how to do it on the local level, how to do it in a way that's fair and balanced, that keeps media freedoms, but also safeguards uh, the public interest. Okay, maybe just to jump on that a little bit. <clears throat> I think when it comes to regulation, and especially from the government, uh, I was actually recently at the Internet Governance Forum, and the lucky thing, or I think the thing that I liked most about that forum, the Kenyan uh, Youth Internet Government Forum, is that they identify mis- and disinformation as a problem. And that is the start, yeah? So once you identify that, now I will bring another context. So you usually have normal protests where everyone uh, in, in, a, in a country, you're allowed to do a protest, but you're not allowed to ban someone's shop, right? The government now regulates at that point because you can do your protest against a certain policy, a certain issue that is happening in the country, but you're not allowed to distract, uh, to destroy property while you're doing that. So on the online space, you have the freedom of expression. You have the freedom to share content. But this information is now equating to destroying property because you're now, uh, you're now like destroying the intellectual property, which is people's minds. You're not playing with people's minds. So the regulation should now focus on that. So not only, so it should definitely be, needs to be thought about, how do you actually implement it so that it doesn't, uh, uh, of course, go into, it doesn't cross over to the freedom of exp uh, expression or, uh, uh, online, where you are, you are supposed to share content anyway, like you, you have the liberty to share content and you have the freedom of information. But not in a way that it is deceiving not in a way that will influence or impact on the third party or the recipient of the information. So the regulation should focus on that. I know many countries right now, even in Africa, they've implemented the data protection rules, but now that is being used against civic society, like people who are now uh, uh, raising their voices against pertinent issues in the country. So it's being implemented against that. So disinformation also can be used to as that kind of an avenue, but it just needs to be sat down and thought up about internationally, not even in Kenya, internationally, come up with the well-defined policies on how to govern the internet and social media content so that it's easier to prosecute based on that. Yeah? And right. that way you'll be able to regulate it. Okay, interesting. Ruby, I'll come back to you. You want to say something? Yeah, about, yeah. Okay, cool. Actually, it's more of a question to Alan and Rubio, to what they've just talked about. Then what happens when the Ministry of Information and Technology in the country, like in the Ugandan case, 
when we reached out to Facebook and Twitter, they were able to trace back all that misinformation to the ministry. So what happens in that particular situation where the government itself or the ministry that you can go to and tell them, hey, this is being abused, are the ones abusing the system? So in that context, the law protects everyone, right? It doesn't matter whether you're government employee or not. So you put it in that perspective. Even if it is a political person who is on the street destroying property, it will still apply, right? So if it's the government that is now, you know, in, in the world we have different uh, capacities of organizations. We have businesses, we have, uh, uh, we have governments, then we have the civil society. And the reason the civil society exists, and also the media, of course, is to hold the government accountable. So whenever there is a law that protects everyone, so in case the government is the one who is using, uh, who is abusing that law, then civil society will rise up against them, highlight those issues. We have Transparency International. We hold, they, also, they hold uh, the government on corruption issues, accountable on that. So even on disinformation, the law that they create and the policies can still be held against them. So it's, the, it's a matter of now creating it first, Okay. And then the implementation now follows in a regulated way, of course. Yeah. Ruby, you want to you want to say something on that? I mean, we just went through the experience of the United States on January sixth through the situation where freedom of speech hit up against kind of violence and, and violence, and um, I guess it's still playing out. So, so we'll see. Yeah, um, I wanted just to now go on away from online misinformation and disinformation to actually politicians who go out there to spread it and when the media is actually reporting it, right? I have seen, especially at the, at the peak of the elections, people go out there and, and spread misinformation and disinformation and this same messaging is actually portrayed in traditional media and it has a ripple effect on the people who are listening to that information. So my question, I think, goes to Paris. Do you think as the media or as, an invest, as investigative journalists, we've gone out there to, to counter this misinformation or disinformation that comes through from the different political players uh, in our different countries to you know, fact check them, call them out um, you know, enough so that we put them to account? I think for the most part that there, there has been that effort. The effort has been there. And maybe now allow me to recommend that uh, guys watch part of the investigation coverage we had in 2017, in the last election. Go and watch Siasa Pesa Propaganda. That's a good documentary on, okay, translates to Siasa Pesa Propaganda for the sake of Kevin and everyone watching. It translates to politics, money, and propaganda. That was within the election coverage that we did. And it really, was packaged well to show how politicians at the time were using both online machinery and on the ground, physically bribing people to go and start mudslinging, and we all know what that spiraled into. So I would say there has been an attempt, but the challenge normally is you cover that when it is, as it is happening. So when it breaks out is when you start following. And the thing with our politicians, I mean, I think everywhere, for the most part, they will tell you what you want to hear. And a lot of it normally is PR campaigns. So something, you expose something, they will counter it with something else. Even just recently, with the, you saw what happened with the Pandora Papers. Our president as well was very quick, they were very quick to react and say he will address. Well, we are still waiting. But generally, that is how politicians work. So I mean, it's something we have to keep working on as we go. I wouldn't say there's a clear cut way of doing it, but for the most part, that's our job, to hold them accountable. Sure, they might tell you what you want to hear, but let there be that attempt. We have to keep trying. I don't think there's a clear cut answer to this, but we just have to keep trying. And now that we are even diversifying how we are doing it, by moving our staff more, more, more digital spaces now. So even the, the, the manner in which we've been covering our staff, because ours is not a mainstream newsroom that you watch seven o'clock, nine o'clock, at least we have a bit more time to take and research and do and package things differently with the time that we are given. But it's something that we have to keep 
trying and looking for new ways to address as we move on, especially now moving into next year. With the COVID situation, it's a, there's a lot of uncertainty, as with every election in Kenya. But I think as storytellers, as the media, it's something you have to keep diversifying, adapt and move quickly as we go. Yeah, yeah, please, Ruby. Just to mention, uh, one of the things is that, uh, I mean, globally, a lot of media becomes more and more digital and digitized because the business model has not held up with media outlets. And as uh, it becomes more digitized, journalists rely on more stories that are kind of, that they find online. And I think what's going to be the challenge going forward is thinking about how journalists cover these stories that are not stories, and particularly disinformation that is on the digital sphere. Analog disinformation, disinformation that's passed around on the streets, um, in traditional media, newspapers, um, through religious institutions, through youth organizations, places like that. I think that's going to be a challenge of, of going forward for media outlets and journalists as they kind of turn themselves more towards digital journalism to uh, cover. Yeah, the reason why I brought out this conversation is because I know that um, uh, Africa Check, um, has that opportunity to fact check leaders um, and their speeches. They go back and say, hey, are you actually saying the truth? Are you actually telling a lie? Are you spreading propaganda? And then they put you out there. So I think that um, the power of collaboration with institutions like Africa Check, you know, Code for Africa, whose core mandate is actually to do verification and you know, do investigations back end. I think for me, they will really, really um, will support journalists to put, uh, put, to put it out there because that's one way of fighting them. I mean, why do you let a president go away with a statement, you know, that you think is going to affect people? How do you let a politician make, stand up on a pulpit and say this, and the next day it's a top story because he said it, but it's actually misinformation and disinformation that it just takes you time to just go out there and do some fact checking, do some reading, you know, and then just put out a one or two minute clip to say, you know what, what you're saying is actually wrong in a way that makes them um, ashamed and they're more careful about what they're saying and all that. But um, Ruby, I just wanted to draw you in into the international, um, the way the international community plays around this subject of misinformation and disinformation and how people who have understood how the game is played are taking advantage of it to make money um, in, in Africa, most, especially during the political times. I mean, if you look at the Sudan incident, um, I think Facebook closed pages and some of them were being operated in Russia, according to that report. The Cambridge Analytica issue was clearly um, a game plan of, of, that was well executed from abroad. Um, working with entities here in Africa to actually uh, look at the characteristics of the way co information was consumed and using that information to direct specific communication to people so that to be in their faces and to spread uh, propaganda. What, how, how do we even, how did we get there? And what can we do to actually hold people to account? especially in the international players who are pushing for interests in a way. Yeah, well, with the case of Sudan um, and Yegevni Prozhin, um, I think it's important to, to, to think about kind of his uh, business interests and his business interests around kind of um, the work that he's doing there and, and how he was trying to promote it. Um, certainly, he could have promoted himself much more authentically through PR firms. Uh, instead of using inauthentic accounts. Uh, I think that's one way of kind of doing that is trying to hold uh, foreign corporations and foreign businessmen to account on what, the, what they're doing in country and maybe even kind of helping them to, to kind of understand how best to promote themselves in, in an authentic type way. Okay, um, I'll get to you, um, um, Alan. Do you, want, do, you want, do you want to say something about the international 
community or you know foreign powers playing into the misinformation and disinformation game and yeah. in, in terms of promoting the agenda but also propaganda so one thing we should know is that uh, Africa is quite a, quite a rich continent we have a lot of resources that are target of other nations uh, outside Africa so and the information space is usually a prime way of playing it, it, it out so that they get access to those resources. So think of which foreign nation has an interest in our country. Which resources are they targeting? How are they playing out? How are they playing that out? Are they using disinformation? Are they using misinformation? So you need to think, think of it that way and highlight anything that is happening. Uh, I know where it started is uh, traditionally we've seen investigations that cover use of bot accounts, use of sock puppet accounts, but now it's being converted into authentic voices. So rather than using these inauthentic accounts, how do we actually reach to the local people through the local people? And that is why you're seeing media houses being co-opted into doing this. Yeah, That is why you're seeing uh, as, as you mentioned, there's a report that you read where Africans or someone, uh, Africans are actually put in a room, given computers and laptops to start sharing information. And because they know the local languages, they even go deep, they use the local language, the authentic language. So you'd never know if this person is working for a foreign actor at the end of the day. So it's getting that complex. And we need to now create mechanisms to identify, first of all, you do what we call vulnerability assessment. How vulnerable is the country that you're living in? Yeah. What are the interests that these other nations have when it comes to foreign influence, that is? And then how are they getting access to that? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to engage you a little bit more on, now that we've talked about all these things, what can you point to, to an investigative journalist to look out for if they are to take a deep dive into misinformation and disinformation on the platforms, social media platforms, what, what are those pointers that you think we can use to say, hey, I think this is something not usual. Um, when you look at this and this, it doesn't add up. Why don't I call, for example, Code for Africa? What are those little things that give, give these campaigns away, uh, propaganda campaigns away? Yeah, so I think, number one, you need to consider several things. And the best way, so how I'm doing it right now, is starting from the vulnerability assessment perspective, where you are looking at how many uh, media houses at the moment in our country are publishing content that you would not expect them to publish. Yeah, that is one. On social media, how Say many again. conversations... Can, can you just expound on that a little bit? So, uh, how we've seen it happening uh, recently is that whenever there is uh, some interest that a foreign nation wants to explore on a country, for example, like Kenya, so they will look at a loophole where, the loophole here is whenever we have elections, they want to control who gets into government because if it's a friend of ours who is in power, then we have access, right? So, you'll start seeing, for example, uh, Pages, social media pages, if you are looking at social media, social media pages registered in a foreign nation publishing so much content about your country. Then you're like, ah, how? How does this person know a lot about our country? Then number two, because they are now going to be to authentic voices, you need also to look at the language itself. Yeah? Who is it promoting? Whose interests is it promoting? The media houses. If, they start, if a media house starts publishing content, a lot of content, that they will not necessarily publish at the end of the day, uh, you need to look at who owns this media house, right? That will tell you a lot. So, so how, they, how we've seen it happening is there are a couple of media houses, say, for example, in the CAR, when you go and look at their ownership information, or in South Africa, for example, when you look at the ownership of that media house, there's actually some percentage of shares allocated to a foreign entity located in a foreign nation. Yeah? So if you look at all that context, you know there's some co-option 
and there's a target that is happening. So try to think of that. Try to see all those red flags. Then you'll be able to actually understand what is happening. And also, even uh, and we are not saying that it's not in, uh, investment into Africa is bad. But using disinformation and propaganda to promote that agenda is now the thing that we are, we are against, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, um, <laughs> you want to say something about that? Okay, cool. Let me, let me come back to you, Paris. Paris the, the, the role of investigative journalism in exposing this. Um, the Cambridge Analytica was an investigation um, that really blew off the lead, and it had a lot of impact on that. I remember Mark Zuckerberg, um, you know, appearing before different committees. It was a national, an international issue, and uh, they called him out, and we saw some sort of accountability. What is the role of investigative journalism in pushing back against misinformation and disinformation? I think it goes back to our core, really. I mean, we're investigative journalists. So our core is to expose. So if there's anything that you have, you have identified that could be problematic, and ultimately, it will cause damage for, and it is important for public interest, you need to expose it. So again, it goes back to what? Having the necessary skills. It is going back to that. Because if I don't have the skills, I need to expose this. If I do not know, like just how Alan has explained, the ways to identify this. If I have no idea that I can look at this and be able to tell A, something is wrong, then ultimately the goal will not be achieved. So it needs to go back there. Let's train our newsroom journalists. We need to know, we need to have the know-how. Not just how to package these stories, but how to identify. This is a new territory, yes, it is online. But I need to be in a position to know that when I see a particular hashtag being pushed by a particular account, that there is something wrong. So first of all, it has to come back to me having the know-how to doing this. So if we can ramp up that across the continent, again, go back to collaborating a bit more than we are doing right now. I think we're in a good place, and that's why we're having this conversation. But if we can increase that going forward, it's something I really encourage. We need the skill set. We need the skill set, I mean, when you need the tools. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Ruby, do you want to say something about that? Yeah. I, I just wanted to kind of um, dig deeper on terms of the how journalists cover disinformation, because there's this central concept in journalism where you want to give a balanced review of the of the issue and just the fact of covering an issue of disinformation brings different that piece of disinformation to the forefront so what i'd like to do is i'd really like to challenge journalists around the world journalists in africa to really think about how you provide balanced coverage but not give traction to the pieces of disinformation yeah. um, because that's very sensitive and it can really kind of exacerbate the issue yeah i agree um, so the, the aspect, one of the things that we're doing at the African Institute for Investigative Journalism is training and capacity building and raising, um, you know, trying to equip journalists, investigative journalists with skill sets uh, in investigative reporting. And I think I cannot absolutely wait for a training which we can have maybe with Code for Africa, African Uncensored, um, you know, and maybe Africa, Africa Check where we can all come and you know, train investigative journalists around some of these key issues. Um, what, what do they have to look out? How, you know, what can they do? And, and how can we collaborate on a project? I mean, Kenya is coming up, the elections. I think if we can have a collaborative investigation um, together with different civil society organizations, uh, different investigative journalists from different parts of East Africa, and having, you know, a, a common objective of countering misinformation and disinformation through an investigation by studying the analytics and you know looking out for those little things i think that we can together you know push back with a more stronger voice um i know that and, and, and thanks to code for africa for looking out you know from from kenya to look at the dynamics in uganda we published a report too on 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 um in collaboration with the Conrad and nwasiftang on, on, on how social media spaces were used as um, manipulative tools during Uganda's election. So I think the power of collaboration and, and training and, and empowering journalists 
um, can go a long way in calling people out and, and, and pushing back uh, against uh, misinformation. Um, just to say special thanks to everyone who's watching, I want to now to give an opportunity to um, our audience to um, speak back and share your views and thoughts um, that have been coming through on Twitter, on Facebook, but also we have a live audience here. Um, if you have a question you want to share, please put up your hand and the cameras will look for you and you are able to share your thoughts in about a minute or so because we are about to wrap up and uh, go into our next sessions. Any thought process, any, um, any ideas from the audience here? Any additions, subtractions? Okay, yeah, we have a couple of hands there. Um, I'd request, you know, someone to help me with the mic so that we can get some of the views. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll make it quick um, before the session officially closes. Uh, we'll have, um, okay, so how do we do it? Thank you, I'm Cecilia Okoth, and I work with a new vision in Uganda. Um, Paris, is it Paris? Yeah, it was interesting for you to come in our backyard and dig up all that information about misinformation that in turn traced, I mean was traced back to the ICT ministry. But one of the frustrations I get as an investigative journalist is that most of us, or should I speak for myself, do not have the capacity to follow the, the story to where I would have wanted it to be. Um, Anas Aremeo, for instance, in, in Ghana, usually investigates and makes sure that the perpetrators are put to book and he even follows up with a team of lawyers to have such culprits arrested. But, but this is something that most of us may not be able to do as well. So how then should we um, be able to expose, not only expose, but ensure that we get the kind of feedback in terms of um, holding the people that be accountable. For instance, what did the ICT ministry say when you pinned them with this kind of evidence of misinformation being traced back from their, from their, from their ministry? And then finally, Solomon had asked Alan about what to look out for if they're, if, what to look out for if they are if we are to investigate on misinformation, I didn't get some of the viable tips that you can share with us in order for us to go back and do the homework. Um, do we want to take up that or we first get like two or three? I guess my panelists can note down some of those things. Okay, so we'll do just two questions. Then they will, we will get feedback, then we'll come back to you. How does that sound? Perfect. Good. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rahim Nwali from the African Institute for Investigative Journalism. Thank you so much for the ideas. Um, I think this is a very important discussion, most importantly, because the world is just going digital. And I think that my take home is, is what uh, Paris you know, brought up of training journalists on how to tell these kinds of stories to the people that really, really matter. And so what I didn't actually capture was, do you think that the, the social media giants are not doing enough in this regard? Do you think that there's something that can be done more, just more than just you know, blocking some of these accounts? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. We'll take the two first, then we can do another round. Otherwise, the questions will be, um, you know, um, missed. I'll start with Alan. You want to take it first, then Paris can come through. Okay, Paris, let's start with you. Um, you had it, you came to our backyard, played ball, and um, the issue that Cecilia is raising is impact. And I'll also speak to that, but I'll give you the opportunity. How do we ensure that stories that are done are impactful? Okay, thank you for that. I mean, I sh the frustrations are something I share with you, but I think with regard to how much access you have, like you compared, uh, you mentioned someone like a nurse, you know? Now, I work with John Allen, 
And I can tell you, working with someone who has years of experience doing this, there's, there's something um, that comes with experience that gives you a lot more exposure. So I would say it's something that comes with experience one, and it helps to work with someone who has that kind of experience. So I mean, because personally, I think I'm now going on six years in this industry. Uh, surprising, because some of you are looking at me like, gosh, how old is she? But <laughs> I can't tell. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so working with someone who has definitely has more experience than you helps, because they have more access, they have a larger network than you, and they would know how what, even what to do in an emergency situation. Sometimes you go in the field, you're very excited about a story, but it also, you're, you're at, in the moment, you're not thinking about even the security risks that you're walking into. And that's one of the things that I've had to learn over the years. Again, going with, who are you going with to the field? Going with a cameraman who has been doing this for, for years again, they know. There are things they will see that you will never see. Because sometimes you go to the field and my cameraman will tell me, we need to leave. Personally, I don't see why in the moment. I mean, it's something again that comes with experience, with time. You're able to read the environment, read the room, and you can tell there's a problem, yeah? So working with people who have more experience than you, that one has been of um, major help to me. Because with time, it's, it's, it becomes easier for you. Not that it becomes safer necessarily, but it becomes easier to maneuver. So the frustrations, I can share that with you. It's something I have had to struggle with that you do something for so long, you've taken your time, you think you have nailed it, uh, but once it is out, no one is talking about it, you know? I think this is something that every journalist has experienced at some point in their career. But with regard to how much impact it has, you can only do so much. Let me put it that, you can only do so much. Do your best to promote it, get to the right people, make sure that you're reaching out. You know, there's something we call uh, having rights of replies with every in investigation that you do. That is standard practice. And one thing that we all agree on is that even when they don't respond, that's a response. So no response is a response in itself. So if you reached out to the Ministry of IT, you reached out to the president, you reached out to whatever uh, politician that you have targeted, you reached out to Facebook, to Twitter, and they did not respond, that is a response. So what do you do in your, in your documentary, in your article, in whatever feature that you are doing? Then you make sure you point that out. It's always a point to point, to something to, to point out to your audience. We reached out to so-and-so, as at the time of publishing, they had not responded. And if they did, share that as well. If they respond after the publication, update it. There's always room for that. I think that's the one thing we can all appreciate. So I think, uh, with regard to how the Ministry of ICT in Uganda responded and also to the impact, I think you can add more on that, but I'll allow Alan to address that. Can I just say something about that? One of the most frustrating thing as, as an investigative journalist, and I've done a couple of stories, I think is to do a good investigation, put your life on a line, and no one talks about it or you don't see the impact of that investigation. And I think that now goes beyond just doing a good story. Some, one, one person whispered in my ears last week is that a good story that has not been watched and promoted may not actually be a good story because not, not so many people have watched it. So I think that beyond just doing that investigation, there, is, there must be a deliberate effort to actually promote the investigation so that people consume it, but not just everyone, that the people who are in places of power consume that information. You know, how do you look at, for example, uh, the Pandora Papers? There was, an, there was a deliberate move to promote that story. You know, there, there was a deliberate move. I mean, artwork was done. You know, everyone, the, there was a build up to the launch of that investigation. They made sure the big boys knew it, you know. They made sure, you know, civil society knew about the launch of that film. They, so that, you know, as an investigative journalist, you do the story, but 
there must be a delivery effort to actually market the story out there to people who are supposed to actually take action, you know? And I think that's using investigative journalism as a tool for advocacy. Which civil society organization is into work around advocating for, you know, um, maybe online safety or fighting misinformation? Because they're supposed to do the advocacy. Alan was saying that the ones that have to put government on the spot because that's their job. You know what I mean? Like which member of parliament is actually heading a committee on ICT? I, I, I might, you know, how do I make sure that he watches that documentary? That the next day is going to raise it as an issue of national importance on the floor of parliament and that the issue is actually taken at committee stage for investigation. How do, for example, how can, you know, an association of investigative journalists come up and you know, build up support for the, for the story and start a conversation around the finding of, of the investigations. Because if you just do the story and put it out there, I think that investigative journalists need to go just beyond that. They also have to get interested in how do they make the story go out there that it is consumed, but it's also consumed by the very people who are actually supposed to, who, who hold power, who can say, you know what, this investigation that was published deserves attention. And as civil society, as maybe you know, government entities, as, as, as the media, we need to all get concerned. It is very frustrating to do an investigation and no one talks about it and it doesn't live beyond just you know, the papers and the videos that you have done. And I think many of the investigative journalists out there just do the story and put it out there. I think that what history has taught us is that that's not enough and that we can do more. Rubis, you want to say something about that? I just wanted to agree with you on that point. There's so much content that's developed out there right now that it's really hard to kind of highlight the content that the public should really be uh, reading or seeing or listening to. Um, and so I think that's important. Can I, um, can I respond to the internet platform? Um, the question on the internet platform is, you asked about whether it should be regulated in a way. Was that the question? Yeah. And I wholeheartedly agree. I've come to this conclusion that the large social media platforms do need to be regulated. Um, I think that they hold their business interests first. Whether they're well-intentioned or not, I think their business interests trump everything. And there are, as we've seen, kind of with the recent whistleblower that testified in Congress uh, about Facebook, uh, she was saying that the algorithm was changed. So they used one algorithm during the US elections, which kept the level of disinformation low. And then they changed back to another algorithm, which made them more biz money. And the January 6th uh, riots in, um, in, in DC happened. And so that there definitely are ways that social media platforms um, need to be, um, need to have accountability from states. Um, yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, let me go to you, Alan. One of the issues that was raised, I think it was by Cecilia, he, um, she said that you did not, you know, um, I think that she needed more clarity on what are the pointers? What should we look out there uh, to be suspicious that this could actually be misinformation um, that we need to look into? Yeah. Yeah, so there's actually a reason I, uh, I only highlighted it as a high level because we have a session this afternoon uh, by Jean Gidai covering the nitty gritties on how the, even the Uganda election was, uh, was reviewed, how did we identify the case, what was done, what was the methodology. But as a high level, uh, we normally know that elections are prone to misinformation, right? And we know the names of the most popular people who are part of that election. We know uh, uh, like the vulnerabilities that are there in terms of the internet and social media situation. So uh, at Code for Africa, what we do is we have what we call watch lists. So these are names of 
politically exposed people, names of prominent institutions that you have as a list. Then you feed that into social media monitoring tools. So we have access to social media monitoring tools and media monitoring tools. And what that means is you have access to, let's say, Twitter data, and you can be able to derive insights from that data. And then you, you have access to media articles, so you can be able to know which stories are getting highlights, right? And you now follow up on the most viral content. So we do have access to, that, uh, to those, and those are, when uh, Paris is talking about trainings, those are the skills that we try to give the, the journalists that we work with. So we tell them there's a tool called CrowdTango, which has access to Facebook data. There's a tool called Meltwater, which has access to Twitter data. There's a tool for every pl platform that you want to review. And that way, when you have like a predefined way of thinking about where is the vulnerability, you're able to set up queries, you're able to set up those watch lists to look at any amplification around that topic. So like for the Uganda one, of course, we had the, the names of the two candidates, two most controversial candidates in Uganda at that time. We also had the name election itself. And what that means is those tools could pick up spikes in the, or increase in mentions of these, these words. And it will tell Alan, Alan, uh, there's a spike in the number of mentions around this topic that you're tracking. And what that means is we can now go and review why. Why was there a spike? Do we have accounts that are now, of course, working in a coordinated way to push this messaging? And that's how we were able to pick those up. So it's, it's, and also we encourage journalists to go into what we call data journalism, because as they say, data is the new oil. It's able to give you a lot of viral information as soon as it happens. And if you're able to now manipulate data, and social media is data, uh, I know many people probably think, a Facebook post is just information. It's actually data that sits in a Facebook database somewhere. And how you have access to that data and now derive insights from that, that data, you as a journalist, it will be more beneficial from that. So the trainings come in in that perspective. So how do you manipulate this data to give you insights? I know you asked about Facebook's uh, response to the Ministry of ICT. Uh, I mean, the Ministry of ICT's response to Facebook. So, key thing I wanted to highlight is, as investigators, we identify the problem, but we are not able to attribute it as efficiently as the platform itself. So the okay. attribution of who did this was actually not from us. Us as investigators, we just realized that there's something happening here, and we told Facebook, you guys need to look into this. And when they actually reviewed it, they found the evidence that there's a linkage to this entity. And that's how now the conversations happens in that level. So for us, our work is to point, point out the, uh, uh, the things that are happening, and then now follow-up is done uh, uh, on that point. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, thank you. We, um, I'm supposed, we, we've been informed that we may have to go back to the main conference, but can we just rush? I saw two more hands as they're trying to sort the technical issues. Let me give an opportunity to the two gentlemen. Um, you kindly introduce yourself. Um, raise your question. We'll also, add, as, from this end, try to answer it as, as fast as we can. Then we can join the rest of the co conference. Thank you very much. My name is Shemei Agabo from the African Institute for Investigative Journalism. I have a question, and it goes out to Alan and Rubio. Um, at the African Institute for Investigative Journalism, we worked on a paper called Digital Voter Manipulation. Uh, how the online spaces were used into the 2020-2021 Uganda general election. Now, the buzzword today is, uh, you know, uh, digital innovation around media viability. And for me, it's interesting how, how governments, for example, are shutting down the internet. And it would be interesting for me to find out how, for example, the media can safeguard, especially journalists and people who are innovating, m m digital innovations around journalism to keep it uh, flowing and working to tap into the digital spaces. So my question would be, how do we navigate around internet shutdowns, but also safeguard the data of people they are availing on these online spaces, given that there is a lot of innovation happening 
around media viability. Thank you. Um, thank you. We, we'll have the last one from you, and then we'll get to answer those, those two questions, and we can go back. Oh, you, you also have a question? Okay, cool. We, we'll give you an opportunity as well, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is uh, Ronald Msoke from uh, the Independent uh, Magazine in Kampala. Um, it's been a, a very interesting uh, session for me, but I have one uh, key, uh, key point to make, and it's, it's about uh, um, the political context of, uh, of some of uh, our countries, yeah? The disinformation plays, uh, plays out differently in, 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 in these uh, countries. The way this information is uh, uh, interpreted here in, in Kenya is quite different from uh, our Ugandan context. The reason I said, I said this is um, uh, the, just, just like uh, you guys have been discussing, the uh, just ended the uh, general election, there was um, an issue of um, um, the bloggers. Yeah, this is something I've not uh, heard you talk about a little more. Uh, you, you seem to be prescribing solutions for the legacy media, the traditional media, the print, radio, and, uh, and TV. What doesn't come out uh, clearly is, uh, is uh, the, new, the new kids on the block. I don't know about the Kenyan context, but in Uganda, these people were such a big uh, influence. They gave a big headache to, to the system, and that's why there was that back and forth uh, pulling of ropes. So I don't, know, I don't know how or whether these uh, solutions, uh, Alan, particularly you, Alan, you prescribed would, would fit, would fit in a context like uh, Uganda's. How do you deal with uh, uh, these people who, are, who, who actually don't care about uh, our, the way we understand ethics? Yeah, they just put out things there. It's, it's, it's a challenge for me, yeah. I would have said something about uh, the regulation, but maybe we don't have time, so I'll give... The, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Ronald, I, I'll give Mom the last opportunity. You can introduce yourself, then you can raise your comments. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kokio Cheng. I am from USIU Africa. I'm really keen on Africa Czech and uh, Africa Uncensored because those are people you've seen grown over the times. And of course, I'll still ask the, the rest to contribute. I just want to know what do you think, do you do an assessment of the impact of the work or the solutions that you provide, especially Africa Czech and also Africa Uncensored? Do you feel that your stories have a, a, polit a policy impact? so that we can say you're providing solutions uh, to, I mean, you're doing solution journalism that is having a real impact. Because uh, you've been around for quite some time, and we want to know whether you do an internal assessment to see whether that is a possibility. And to the remaining panelists, you talk about disinformation and misinformation, and you all know it's a tactic for politicians to use. So. Uh, what is your uh, our input on issues like um, media and information literacy for audiences so that that can have an impact in the way they perceive information uh, they receive from the media? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'll let my panelists address these issues. I think I'll start with Paris. Oh, Alan, you already have the mic, cool. Let's go first, I think the first question uh, from Shemay was how do you draw a balance between um, government shutdown and, you know, <laughs> and, and, and fighting uh, disinformation or misinformation. I think that, that captures that from my end. I don't know if it does more, but yeah, your reactions to all the questions that have been raised and we'll get to Paris. Yeah, so uh, I'll cover the navigating internet shutdowns question first. Uh, we know that's, uh, that's something that has happened a lot. Of course, we don't encourage governments to do that in any way because that means you're limiting the freedom of expression at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, uh, as citizens, how do you navigate it? Or even as media professions, how do you navigate that? I think how you can do it is uh, for us at Code for Africa, we do use like uh, digital security uh, uh, mechanisms 
so that even though there's an internet shutdown, it doesn't really affect you. I know many media houses do that to at least protect their interests. They need to cover it. We also, I know in Ethiopia, there has been a lot of that happening, uh, internet shutdowns, and the approach that the media took on that front was number one, using VPNs. I know some, some countries that is now becoming illegal, but you need, us, of course, to look at the situation you're in. Then number two, there's the diaspora community. So what we've seen happening in Ethiopia a lot is that even though the conversation is not being consumed or even generated from within the country, we do have diaspora community who can speak on your behalf and highlight what is happening in the country. So using external resources, and that is where collaboration also helps. When the media in the specific country doesn't have the capability to cover the story, there is other media houses outside the country that can highlight on behalf of, of, the, of, of, of like the media house that has not been able to do that. So partnerships and collaborations, I know Pandora Papers, if it was only focusing on Kenya or even Uganda probably, it will, uh, it will, there will be an internet shutdown so people don't read it, but it was a consortium. So it was a group of people who partnered all over the world to expose the atrocities around that or to expose the situation around that. And that way you get coverage even with no coverage. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, then we'll get to Paris in a minute, minute, then we can join the audience discussing the killing of Nyamas, uh, I think, in, in South Africa. Yes, Paris. I think with uh, regard to policy impact, it's something we have struggled with over the years. Why? Because there's a thin line between the kind of work we do and activism and journalism. And I think these are things, it's an ongoing conversation we normally have. You have to separate, there's a very thin line. The kind of work we do, one, we don't do PR. So you will not come to us with a story and tell us, hey, there's this and this and this that we want you to do for us and we will pay you. It's not the kind of journalism we practice. Whereas you can go to another media house and they will do that for you. But it's not in the, it's not in the under the category. It's not how we operate. So getting impact on something we have done, one, it's something that takes time. And another, another thing, it requires patience. So the most you can do in our capacity, one, highlight. Just highlighting it and putting that info out there. Trying as much as possible to get uh, feedback from the people you're accusing of doing this and that. That's always how we go about it. But it is normally very hard to control just how much will come, will, will come out of what you have done. Because even if we are, we are looking to, to say um, we exposed so and so they got fired or the government took action, it doesn't always work like that. Especially when you're dealing with corruption. Because these are cases that take years and years and years. Like I think the one that I can say come, comes to mind that worked even though it did after many years of, of following up, because that's key, you have to follow up. Don't do a story today, and then after it is published, you move on to the next one. That is not how this kind of work uh, operates. You need to keep following up. So we, we left this investigation. It was about lead poisoning in Owinohuru, in the coastal part of Kenya. I think that is the one up to date I can point out and tell you something eventually was done. Now, was it immediate? Absolutely not. But it took time engaging the necessary people. Now, this is where, when we have highlighted this, now we can talk to uh, other organizations. We can go and talk to uh, Amnesty. We can go and talk to lawyers, to organizations that can have create that kind of impact. Because that's where we draw the line. The minute you cross that line and step into activism, and uh, in as much as we try to dance around advocacy, they, it, it's a very thin line to be treading on. So you need to be careful. Because once I step on this line today, tomorrow if I need to report uh, something negative about the same person, then it becomes a challenge. So it's just something that requires time. You have to just keep persistently doing it. And once you follow up on something today, I come and tell you this and this happened, we are reporting on this particular case, you have to follow up next year, give an update. If something new comes up, even if it's just a tweet, it doesn't have to be a whole production. Even if you're going to put out a press release as a, as a media house and tell them, in 2017, we covered this. This is what has happened so far. 
and you can revisit the story to get some bit of context. If there's a part two you need to do, you continue, but it's just persistence. So there's no clear cut of telling you that this is how we are going to impact, how, how create impact. We can look at the numbers and say, okay, people talked about this. There was a whole network, a million people watched, so what? Yeah? So assessing that it's something we, we, are, we are trying to do and finding ways to do, but again, it has to be collaborative. Perfect. Rumi, I'll give you a minute um, to wrap it up, and then we can join the global conversation. Sure. Um, just picking up on Paris's kind of conversation about impact, um, I think it's really difficult to kind of look at the instances of impact that the work has, investigative journalism, fact-checking work has. I mean, part of it is that the platforms that carry the disinformation aren't always the same platforms that counter that carry the counter disinformation messaging and so there's this disconnect there but i think antidotally there 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 are a lot of things that you could point to 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 see whether the the population has a increased understanding of the um the issues around disinformation and the instances of disinformation on your other point about media literacy I think it's super important. I think uh, a lot of what we're talking about right now is really the supply side of disinformation, and we really need to delve more into the demand side. Why are people so vulnerable? How you create resiliency around, um, around populations so that this doesn't affect them. Um, so you're, you're right about that. There has to be more done. Okay, great. A special thank you to my panelists, uh, Kevin, Paris, and Alan. Thank you very much this morning for speaking to us. Let's give them some love, good people. Um, thank you very much for your feedback and comments. We appreciate you. We'll be able to um, get more of your questions maybe while we're having lunch. But thank you very much. All right, now I want to take you to... The main um, event right now, I think we're discussing the killing of uh, one of Rwanda's